Agatha's Soul Cauldron has revived hardened scales in Modern, and this video will prove it. Over the past few days on my Twitch channel, I decided to pick up hardened scales again because the deck has been putting up good results and I couldn't lose with it. I chose to play Lord Eggs List as he top aided the most recent Modern Challenge with the deck. You have all the classic hardened scales affinity creatures in there supported by Urza Saga and Inkmoth Nexus to win games. The next two cards that you should take a note of though are Ozolith the Shattered Spire and Agatha's Soul Cauldron. The Ozolith is just another hardened scales for 2 mana that we can sink mana into if we flood. The Soul Cauldron though is a different story. The Cauldron allows us to exile a card from any graveyard and if it was a creature we can put a plus one plus one counter on one of our creatures we control. Then all creatures we control with plus one plus one counters on them get the activated abilities of the creatures exiled with the Cauldron. Knowing how this card works, I want you to take a look at this play and why this card is so powerful. Okay guys, I want to give you a good example on why the Cauldron is actually just really good in Modern and has the potential to revive Hardened Scales to top tier. I mean, already you saw at the beginning of this video, this is a list that uh, came in the top 8 of the Modern Challenge. It's hard to top 8 Modern Challenges, so it has to be something good about it. Anyways, my opponent here has played a turn 1 Young Wolf. I'm in the blind and I have a Walking Blister, Urza Saga and the Cauldron. Very good ways to attack the opponent on multiple different angles. Something nice about the Cauldron here, and uh, you might be surprised by how I play with it, is that it can exile a card from any graveyard. So specifically against Yogmoth, when the creature dies from Undying, you can exile it with the Cauldron so that they can't get the creature back. So that's why here, even though I draw a Patrick Automaton, I decide to play the Cauldron, because if my opponent can cheat a Yogmoth into play with, let's say, an Eldritch Evolution, I can still exile one of the Undying creatures with the Cauldron and maybe stop them from combo killing me. Here though, they have a Dried Arbor and two Young Wolves. If my opponent doesn't actually impact the board here, there is a line that almost instantly wins the game with the Cauldron. Uh, some of you may see it, some of you may not, but yeah, with my opponent playing a Stranglerootgeist Geist here, the game is almost about to be over. So they hit in for a load of damage and uh, eventually they pass the turn. Okay. Inkmoth Nexus off the top, and now our hand is Patrick Automaton, two Hangerback Walkers, and a Walking Ballista. Don't forget, Patrick Automaton, whenever we cast an artifact spell, we put a plus one plus one counter on it, and Cauldron cares about our creatures having plus one plus one counters on them. So here, I think the line is pretty simple. We can play our Patrick Automaton, it's a 1 1. We can then cast our Walking Ballista for X is 0, that'll put a counter on my Patrick Automaton, and send the Ballista to the graveyard. Now Walking Bliss is in the graveyard, well I can exile it with Cauldron and kill this Dried Arbor because my Patrick Automaton is now Walking Blister. So here uh, we do exactly that. I also cast I think one or two Hangerback Walkers just because we want the Patrick Automaton to be able to block their creatures. And now I was thinking here, if I untap, I instantly win the game because now my Patrick Automaton is a Walking Blister. I can start pinging their Undying creatures and then exiling them with the cauldron. This was just one example of a line that I wanted to show you with this deck. Now why don't we jump into an actual match that I played on my Twitch stream so you can see how a full match plays out with this deck. Okay, this hand is definitely easy to play. The reason why this hand is easy to play is because we have Patrick Automaton and Welding Jar. Patrick Automaton is really well positioned in modern right now because of the War 2 and making it very hard to kill. My opponent seems to agree with this because when they cast a Thoughtseize on turn 1, they do take the Automaton. Drawing a land off the top, there's nothing really much better we can do but get this Hangerback Walker down as well as the Welding Jar as because I was expecting my opponent to be on Rakto Scam. I think we're playing against Scam, right? That is actually wrong because my opponent follows up with an Urborg and an Orcish Bowmaster. This is clearly Mono Black Cabal Coffers and we're going to save this Hangerback Walker with the Welding Jar because we need to be able to attack a Karn the Great Creator if they do have one because the lists do play 4 of. With an Ingmoth Nexus off the top we can play our Arcbound Ravager, put a counter on the Hangerback Walker now to play around a removal spell and pass. The opponent has a Field of Ruin for our land which is unfortunate because we could have almost killed them next turn with Infect Counters. But what's important is we cannot lose to a Karn the Great Creator now. With our Arcbound Ravager getting Fatal Pushed, we're going to put a plus one plus one counter on the Hangerback Walker, making it a 3-3. Now we can follow up with our extra Arcbound Ravager, and then, if need be, we can sacrifice the Hangerback Walker to make three Thopter Tokens so that we can attack a card in the Great Creator if it does come down. With the Besaju off the top, the best thing we can do is play our Arcbound Ravager and pass. The opponent has a Demolition Field, followed up by a Black March to try and kill my Arcbound Ravager. 
I'm surprised by this because now we can put a counter on the Hangerback Walker and then sacrifice it to the Arcbound Ravager so that it doesn't die and we get four Thopter tokens. While my opponent's deck is full of removal and they've been able to destroy a lot of my creatures, now with the Cauldron off the top, all of my creatures with plus one plus one counters on it can be a creature of my choice from the graveyard. I think the Hangerback Walker is the best creature here because we can slowly grow all of our creatures if the opponent has more removal. So do I want to exile Hangerback Walker so that one, one of my Thopters can get massive or do I want to exile Arcbound Ravenger so my Thopter can also get massive? It's all activated abilities, right? Not triggered abilities, so it wouldn't make more Thopters. I think it's still Hangerback Walker though. Now for the rest of this game, the resilience of Cauldron turning these Thopters into bigger creatures really was impactful. My opponent's deck is a mono black control deck full of a ton of removal spells, but despite them casting so many removal spells, this deck was extremely resilient. Hangerback Walker making Thopters, Arcbound Ravager sacrificing things they want to kill, and then we managed to get a combat trick with the Cauldron to prevent our opponent from drawing an extra card to maybe survive an extra turn. I think they're forgetting that this card exiles any card from a graveyard. So now when they cling to dust, I can just exile the card that they target and then they lose. After preventing our opponent from drawing a card with cling to dust by exiling their target, I want to reiterate that Cauldron has a lot of applications in many matchups. Like for example, against Living End it was great, against Yogmoth it's great, against Murktide it's great. A lot of ways to exile the opponent's graveyard slowly, which is quite impactful. Going into game two, again we have the Cauldron in our opening hand and the opponent has a Thoughtseize. After they take the Cauldron from my hand because it's so good against their removal heavy deck, we find a Patchwork Automaton off the top of the deck and then can use Ancient Stirrings to find an extra land in Inkmoth Nexus. This Inkmoth is great because we have Arcbound Ravager, as well as having a third land for Urza's Saga is also good because maybe making Constructs will be necessary depending on how many removal spells the opponent has. With an Ozolith off the top, which is essentially a Hardened Scales, I decide to lead with that because then Patrick Automaton's next turn will be humongous. The opponent cycles a troll and then plays their land and casts Break the Ice on our Inkvoth Nexus to destroy our land that makes colorless mana. Now we can play our Patrick Automaton and hope that the opponent doesn't have a card in the Great Creator. If they do, then our Patrick Automaton will get massive anyways because we can cast artifacts next turn to put plus and plus one counters on it. With the opponent missing their fourth land drop and just passing back the turn, we can now plow through the opponent because we're just going to cast artifacts and put counters on them to absolutely destroy them. Here you can see removal spells just don't really work against hardened scales because so many of our cards create an engine together that one removal spell each turn is just not impactful enough. As well as all of our creatures are really big, so if my opponent can get a chump blocker, let's say from Orcish Bowmaster, it just doesn't do much. So here we managed to kill the opponent because of the Ozolith coming from off of Urza's Saga, as well as Arcbound Ravager, putting so many counters on it. What's nice about this Ozolith on the board is it's different from Hardened Scales because it doubles counters going on a creature or an artifact. So it creates this new math when you're moving counters to and from the one mana version of the Ozolith. Okay, managed to get 4-1. I think my one loss was, you know, played quite badly, but... 4-1, 4-1's a 4-1. As always, gotta open those chests for you gamelay degenerates. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.